In this series, lowimpact.org talks with people working to build a mutually owned, democratic, decentralised economy that builds community and doesn't destroy nature. We want to increase collaboration to bring about system change. Find links to the sites mentioned in the videos in the description below. Join the conversation by liking, commenting and subscribing to our channel. So today I'm talking with Graham Mitchell of Cooperative Care Colm Valley. Hello, Graham. Hi, Dave. I, um, I wanted to talk to you today specifically about your plan for social care co-ops. Uh, you're looking to start a social care co-op in the Colm Valley. That's, that's Huddersfield, isn't it? Uh, yeah, just uh, just uh, west of Huddersfield. That's right, in the in the South Pennines. And you, I know that you also want to build a toolkit or a step by step guide for people who want to st start a social care co-op in their own community. So I'd like to yeah, I'd like to talk about social care co uh, generally. Why co-ops are the best way to deliver it, and and how this toolkit can help grow the cooperative social care sector. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about what drives you be before we talk about exactly what you're doing. So what's, what's the problem that you want to help solve with your work? Uh, well, in, in the context of the, of the, uh, uh, the social care cooperative, um, it's probably worth explaining a little bit of the history of how we got to where we are really that, that might cast some light on that. So <clears throat> it goes back about three years from now and um, so uh, I was part of a group of people that um, you know, we brought together this group of people that were interested in trying to do something uh, on a practical level to, uh, to have some sort of impact on uh, some of the key issues of the day really um so we we had a series of meetings conversations talking about a range of different issues and um looked at various options really that we might um that we might pursue we weren't particularly uh concerned really we did quite a lot of work uh talking and thinking about food related issues obviously there's massive issues with uh, uh, the food system in our economy and um, and access to food, you know, the sort of incredible rise in food bank use and things like that, you know, and the, all of the issues around that massive, massive concerns. Um, and uh, so that was one issue we looked at. We looked at we looked at housing and, and what we might be able to do in terms of housing. Um, and we looked at uh, social care and uh, realising that we couldn't do all, all of this stuff. Uh, we decided, OK, well, we need to prioritise. We need to focus our energy on one particular issue here that we think, where, where we think we can make an impact and have some... Uh, you know, get something working that would, that, that could change the way things happen. I guess I'm and talking about... Decided, the, yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, well, we decided to focus on social care. It's, we thought it was, I mean, uh, then as now, really, it was an issue that was, um, that affects everybody, really, um, one way or another. And uh, it was clear that, then as it is now that social care in this country is isn't working really for anybody particularly well um and and that goes for you know not just people who need or use social care services but also the providers um and uh and the people that commission it the local authorities and uh, organizations that at that end of the supply chain, as it were, you know, um, it's not working for anybody, really. And, and how do your ideas around um, social care co-ops, how do they address that problem? How do they, how would they, how are you thinking that they would make the situation better? Okay. So, uh, I tend to take a very sort of simple view or try to take a simple view of things, a common sense type approach. Um, so, we've got a situation... 
at the moment, you know, where um, the uh, you know the local authorities that that purchase a lot of social care services uh, on behalf of citizens uh, are doing it from a, a position that's really quite difficult for them. So most local authorities in this country are pretty big and uh, so they're trying to sort of purchase services because most local authorities don't provide direct services uh, so much anymore uh, it's all been outsourced um, there is some stuff still there but it's not uh, a huge part of the market as it were um, so they're trying to purchase services on behalf of citizens uh, but they are so far removed from those citizens because of not through any fault of their own but just by dint of their size and the number of people, the, the size of the population that they need to cater for. And that in, in itself is another sort of systemic problem in, in terms of uh, the distance uh, between uh, the electorate and the people that, uh, that govern us essentially. You know, that it's too remote and uh, they're trying to tackle problems at too distant, uh, a scale to larger scale so they lose sight of the, the humans involved um, just by dint of the fact that they're so far away from us all and it all becomes numbers mm. and as a consequence of that the commissioning process becomes very much a numbers game rather than a, a human process so well, one of the things that we wanted to try and do was was tackle that issue and be an organization that was very much close, very close to the people that we were looking to serve. Um, and uh, so that was sort of one facet of it. Another big issue in social care is uh, it's not a very well regarded, it's not a very well paid job for people that work in social care. It's really right down there at the bottom end of the scale you know you get people move in and out of the social care sector um, because they can maybe get a slightly better rate of pay in a different industry or something like that so um, but it's you know it's a it's like nursing you know or um, or um, being an engineer you know it's a profession that um, deserves and demands a lot more respect and um, and better terms and conditions than than it currently has, you know, uh, and that's partly, um, you know, that's a historic thing, you know, I guess partly because it was, you know, it's always seen as uh, a women's work really, um, and. Um, and because the the way that the system operates um especially from a private sector perspective you know the, there's a lot of downward pressure on on pay and conditions that's what, that's what i was going to ask you how, how is most social care provided in the uk and and how is it paid for okay so um i th i think the bulk of social care is delivered by a mix of sort of private and third sector organisations. There's quite a lot of charities and social enterprises in there. But there's also a lot of private sector organisations, depending on which, you know, social care is a very broad thing. So lots of subdivisions within it, I suppose, in terms of target groups and, uh, and services and things like that. But I think by and large, that's how uh, it's structured and what we've what we see is that certainly in the last five years or so probably longer um, as um, austerity has driven down public sector financing uh, then uh, there's a lot of private sector organizations have exited that market 
because they can't make enough profit out of it. It's not saying they can't make a profit out of it, but they can't make enough profit. They're looking for a certain return on their investment as a minimum, and they're struggling to achieve that. So they leave. They can do, you know, because they're profit focused enterprises, so they go somewhere else and do something else where they can get a better return. So that's left a lot of people high and dry. So there's, there's been a process, you know, you talk to people in the sector and everyone seems to have a story about how sort of uh, uh, private sector providers are, uh, are walking away from contracts and leaving the local government holding the baby sort of thing. And they're having to pick up the pieces from this. So how is your social care co-op idea different from the third sector organisations and, and why is it better? Okay, so, I mean, I'm, I've got a long history of involvement in uh, the corporate movement. So, and I'm a, a firm supporter uh, of the whole concept of mutual self-help rather than um, uh, the sort of charitable model where... Um, we do good things to other people, um, uh, which I always think is a bit patronising. And um, I, I much prefer a model where people are actively engaged, actively involved, and providing their own solutions together. And I think that care in particular, if you look at social care and, and what's actually involved there then uh, communities have always been you know family and community has always been the bedrock of social care provision um, and what's happened with this process of uh, what were sort of intervention from the public sector and the private sector it's sort of uh, extracted that element of care from that community setting to a degree I think and it's um, uh, it's sort of uh, you know people think about care and they think about they probably think by default about um, someone else providing that care not them not their friends not their neighbors not their community but someone else and that someone else might be the local authority or it might be a private sector provider or a, a charitable organization but it's not them and i think you know we have all these problems in our society about um how we relate to older people and how they're sort of somehow othered and, and not part of our community um and i think that you know that whole model just plays into that agenda and we need to start challenging that and breaking that down i think so are you saying that so the what, we're, what we're trying to do uh, is re in that context is by using a cooperative model we bring the community together around this idea of of care and sort of reimagining what that care is to a degree trying to and re-embedding care as something that the community does and, um, um, and bringing community together around it. I think. So, that's so, so are you saying that the receivers of the care will be members of the cooperative as well as the providers? Yeah, so the model that we've, we're developing and it's, um, it's an ongoing process it is a multi-stakeholder model. So what we wanted to do was so the people that are, that are most important in the process are the people that receive care and the people that give care. And in the conventional model, neither of them has a huge amount of power. Uh, you know, we just talked about care workers and how badly they're generally treated. Um, and I... And we've talked a bit about the sort of bureaucratic public sector process, which um, with all the best intentions is essentially looking at people in terms of numbers 
because they don't have any alternative at the moment. Uh, so people in receipt of care aren't necessarily getting the best uh, quality of service that they could be doing. So in terms of trying to tackle those dual problems, what we wanted to do was bring those people and give them power and control over what went on so that they are right at the heart of the operation really and and they are co-owners of the of the business operation is it sort of one person one one vote or is it you know loaded a little bit towards the providers or how does it work um well at the moment we're we're looking at a very simple model i think you know there's a recognition that we'll probably need to get more sophisticated and learn as we go and and uh, and get into the sort of detailed conversations that we need to get into with all the various stakeholder groups that are involved uh, to, the, to so that we can really build a more nuanced approach I suppose but at the moment the thought is very much you know let's try and keep it simple let's try and ensure that everybody has got a real stake and, and a real voice and can uh, influence what happens at every level and what kind of care what kinds what different kinds of care will your co-op provide um okay so for the moment we're focusing on uh, the needs of older people so that, um, and uh, but not not necessarily exclusively. So that's that's where the that's where the sort of the big bulk of need is really. So it makes sense for us to sort of learn uh, what we're trying to do by working with that constituency, and uh, and what we're trying to do with our model is is build a, um, a sort of a wraparound type service which is uh, which is not just about regulated personal care but there's also a whole range of other sort of ancillary um, non-regulated community type care services that can be added into that mix so you know people might need specific personal care services which are regulated but there's also a whole raft of other things that they might need you know they might just need help with um you know basic stuff cleaning or gardening or mm -hmm. they might want to pursue interests but, but aren't able to do so on their own uh, they might want to um, go to social events but uh, can't for whatever reason you know so, so trying to understand you know so the our sort of um, our theory of change type thing that we've been that we've been working on is really about um, looking uh, with a, a sort of holistic lens really or trying to look, look holistically at the issue so it's not just about uh, you know so, such and such a person having a specific assessed need but looking at uh, the wider picture and how we can uh, work with that person and with their family and with their neighbours to uh, enable them to uh, to be more engaged, more fulfilled, improve their well-being, reduce uh, issues around social isolation, and all of those sorts of uh, ancillary things that um, that all contribute really to somebody's sense of health and well-being. So what we're trying to do is improve people's outcomes. Uh, in the in a broad sense, and, uh, and what we what we think that we can achieve by uh, by delivering uh, 
a service that, that's sort of designed around that sort of thinking is that that will uh, that will have a positive impact on the service user but it will also have a positive impact on the people around them uh, uh, as well and uh, and sort of raise everyone's boat essentially a, a bit like mutual aid groups yeah it's a bit like that it's obviously it's a more formalized approach i suppose and we've been doing a load of work with mutual aid groups over the course of this uh this year obviously with the pandemic kicking in in the spring you know the mutual aid groups sprung up here as they have done uh, pretty much everywhere else and um we were fortunate in terms of being in the right place at the right time to be able to uh, sort of lend a hand to those mutual aid groups um and i think there's been a really positive uh, process there of relationship building uh, and understanding how we can operate as a, as a sort of a second tier service in a sense or sort of supporting the needs of those mutual aid groups um, and some of them uh, in our locality have uh, sort of fallen back to uh, sort of pre-pandemic level now but others are still going strong so uh, so we're working to uh, maintain dialogue with those groups and understand what their needs are and how we can um, work together as as the situation changes. Now we're moving beyond the sort of immediate health crisis into an economic and a social crisis potentially uh, now with the with the. The economic impact of, of uh, the pandemic hit, starting to hit. You know, people are losing their jobs in significant numbers, um, and that's going to have, you know, long-term knock-on effects on um, on other aspects of of the community that we're in. Yeah, I'm thinking about the effect of austerity measures, which are bound to come, and the sort of reduced state funding for local authorities. Is there a like a plan b and maybe maybe back to the old friendly societies idea where people paid a little a little weekly subscription and, and like a an little insurance policy. Uh, well we've not looked at that particularly as yet i think we are um we are talking to um our colleagues in the local authority because they've been hugely supportive of the Have project they? Have they? right from right from day one um which has been fantastic and, uh, and really quite crucial, I think, in terms of enabling us to get where, to where we are currently. But um, so there's a really good relationship there and there's a good dialogue going on there. And I think that, I mean, I mentioned earlier that um, the commissioning process that local authorities use isn't really very good for them. So I think that they're actively looking to how they might be able to evolve what they do into a more uh, a more helpful model that works better for them and for providers like us and uh, and obviously for end users as well do, do you think your local authority do you think it's a it's a particularly good response from your local authority or do you think it's a tip do you think that would be typical or um difficult to tell really um I think that our I think that our local authority here have have understood that um, you know as a result of ten years of austerity following the uh, the financial crisis um, as a result of that they've had to shift their position so they're no longer the organisation that does everything they're now an organisation that acts to enable community uh, to get on and solve problems um, so i think there's that there is a a real sense of partnership there i think uh, which is great uh, i was a bit cagey a bit um jaded i suppose and cynical initially thinking okay is this just rhetoric or is this for real but the experience 
um, on this and a number of other things has shown, uh, I think, uh, that they're deadly serious about this, um, which is great. That's yeah, really, really encouraging. encouraging. Do um, social care co-ops already exist in the UK? Are there any others? There are. Um, there are a number, um, and we're still sort of mapping that uh, to a degree. We've come across quite a few, uh, and we've started a sort of a dialogue um, with as many of those as we can find who are interested in engaging in that conversation, because I think... Um, I think there's a massive opportunity here um, to make uh, cooperative models, uh, mainstream models really, um, in this sector because what's, uh, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in terms of government. Government have been talking for a decade or more about how they're going to tackle the problem of social care in this country. Um, and they've yet to do that, really, uh, yet to make any real sort of substantive intervention. So it's unclear at this time as to what that might look like, but I can only, you know, part of that has to be uh, more public money coming into the sector because there's clearly a sort of a systemic fault there in terms of insufficient funding um, and I think that it's certainly people that I speak to uh, there's a sort of an inherent understanding there that you know this isn't really a, a market this isn't really a commercial thing it doesn't suit it doesn't fit well um, yeah. and uh, I mean, it may be appropriate for some people, but I think for the vast majority of people, they would probably, um, perhaps in an ideal world, they might say, "Well, I, I'd like, um, I'd like the state to look after me." But I don't think the state's in any position to do that um, now, uh, and I don't think it has any intention of doing that in the future. So. It's about trying to find appropriate models that um, that have that same public sector ethos, but are able to operate independently or, or semi-independently of the state. And I think that the cooperative model fits that need extremely well because it, it gives that uh, community ownership and accountability which i think is absolutely crucial in this in terms of in terms of building solid trust relationships do, do you think that social care could ever come down to a subscription model either sort of payments to some sort of cooperative insurance organization um, or, or well, that, there's, there's no reason why that couldn't happen um i mean a lot of people uh you know the majority of social care is self-funded as I understand it, I've not seen um, sort of a detailed analysis on it, but from what I've given to understand is that the majority of people pay for their own social care. Um, and, but I think that, you know, we're, that might be because uh, as a sort of a historic thing, because obviously we're in that position where at the moment, if you look at the sort of post-war uh, state of play, you know, the people that were those sort of that sort of baby boomer generation, and now the people that are moving into needing social care uh, in their seventies or eighties or whatever, uh, and they've they've done well by the economy by and large. That that um, that cohort, uh, you know, there's a lot of pensioners out there now that are pretty well off actually um, and it's the people that are coming after them the people you know the sort of generation that's coming through now yeah. who are in their 40s now or in their 50s now a lot of them are really struggling you know they've not been not had the same opportunities they've not had the opportunity to get it 
uh, get into this, the housing market to the same extent. Um, and they'll come out um, at the end of their working lives. They'll be that much older because pension ages get, keep getting pushed back and back. And um, there are much less wealthy cohort of people. So they're going to be more and more reliant on um, funding coming from other sources other than themselves to pay to meet their social care costs as they get older and they're going to get older they're going to get a lot older so it keeps happening doesn't it but it's real <laughs> crunch happening you know where where you know we've got an aging population got more and more older people they, they need more and more yeah. care as they get older and yet they don't have the sort of personal wealth that people who are in that older age group now have yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. it's gonna it's gonna get pretty nasty i think um yeah. for a lot of people in the next 20 years or something like that so, so we need i think we need to start developing solutions now yeah that start to tackle those problems yeah. successfully